Thanks so much for taking the time to sit down with us, Dr. Oswalt, to talk about your lecture and your research. Um, so one of the things that uh, your lecture really emphasized was uh, the addressing the question of where in Scripture do we find the doctrine of creation ex nihilo taught? Um, and you made a strong case for finding it in Genesis 1. And there are some evangelicals who, uh, while affirming the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, would find it somewhere else. Um, what I'd like to hear your thoughts on is, um, within evangelicalism, on the fringes, there's a small group who uh, not only don't find it elsewhere in Scripture, but don't think it's true. Um, so what are the theological stakes in affirming the doctrine itself? So not necessarily exactly where do we find it, um, but what's important about the doctrine? Is it central to the Christian witness? Yes, I think it is central. Um, in that, as I said in the lecture, basically you've got two worldviews. One, that this cosmos is everything, that there is nothing beyond this cosmos, and that entails the idea that matter is eternal. The Bible insists that's not correct. God transcends this cosmos. He is outside the cosmos. Our language, of course, is always going to be weak on those kinds of points, but he is other than the cosmos. In a, in a real sense, that's how the Bible can say he alone is holy, he alone is other. And that means that matter is not eternal. So that in a real, in a real way, in my mind, transcendence is entailed in this discussion. If matter is eternal, then at least God is only coexistent with matter and you have two realities. Or God is derived from matter, and then you basically only, with the rest of paganism, have one reality. So really, in a real sense, creatio ex nihilo is the, is the ground of all the rest. Now, ultimately, <laughs> our salvation does not depend on whether we believe in creatio ex nihilo or not. But the implications there for the transcendence of God are so profound that ultimately, yes, our salvation does depend on this because our salvation depends on God's transcendence and his ability then to transcend all that we are and all that we do. That's helpful. So do you think that there are any implications for how we understand um, other attributes of God, like uh, the divine goodness, for example, or the divine power? Um. Yes, I think they are related. I don't think they are as uh, critically dependent as, say, transcendence itself is. But yes, uh, uh, this is the point that Isaiah is making continually. Because God brought the world into existence, therefore, he has the power to intervene and in the case of the greatest power in the world, Babylon, to say, get off the throne. <laughs> I'm going to deliver my people, and you can't stop me because I am the creator. So, yes, I think it does have implications for power. Uh, goodness, I think, would be less entailed in the discussion. Um, but clearly, as, I, as I've already said, his holiness is entailed, and um, um, those, those attributes would be connected. That's helpful. So, if I was understanding your lecture correctly, um, you were arguing analogously from Isaiah and Psalm 51 to creation ex nihilo. Now, so uh, John Webster, another defender of creation ex nihilo and its theological importance, uh, made much of the fact that ex nihilo is uh, sui generis. It's a one-off event. There's nothing else like it. Every other sort of causation that we're familiar with, um, it's dissimilar to that. Yes. Um, but if I was understanding your argument, you were, you were wanting to see 
in these other elements uh, found in Isaiah of creation, something analogous to ex nihilo. Um, I, I wouldn't be comfortable, comfortable with analogous. I, I really would want to argue that Isaiah's use of creation is uh, derived from creatio ex nihilo, that the idea that he alone is the creator means he is able to do things. He's able to see the future. He is able to speak with purposiveness. Uh, he is able to redeem his people because he is the creator. And I'm saying, I'm confident that Isaiah is saying because he created everything out of nothing in the beginning, therefore he is sui generis in terms of the gods. He is, he is completely unlike them and is able to do these things because he is the creator. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say analogy. I, I'd want to say derived from. The order of redemption is in some sense then founded on the order of creation, that because of God's creative power and his creative nature, Isaiah draws out, you know, Isaiah's new creation that, yes. th that these things are happening. Yes, 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 I think that's exactly right, that uh, they are not creator, they are part of the cosmos, and therefore they cannot really do anything new. They can do variations on what always exists, but they're locked in. Whereas he, who is not part of the creation, is able to intervene and change directions. Yes? Yeah. Uh, we can contrast, for example, in Plato's classic account in the Timaeus, the demiurge is said to do the best he could <laughs> with the matter that he found, because the demiurge and the matter are always locked together. And so creation ex nihilo is denying that there's some sort of condition on God's creative activity. He created as he wanted to. In the same way, then, you're denying that there's limits on his redemptive power, that he's, yes. he's, he's, his power in redemption is unlimited yes. uh, by external constraints, as it were. Yes. yes, yes. And the linkage that you have in a couple of places in Isaiah, he who created you is your redeemer. I think that just nails that thing together. Precisely because he is free, he is able to do these things. Yes, yes. So you could almost say that there's a soteriological implication in the creation. Experience. Very definitely. Very, very definitely. That's certainly what Isaiah does, uh, that, that he's, he's hammering that thing. Uh, because the whole point of exile is we're going to assimilate you into the empire. You're going to lose your identity. You're going to lose your religion. You're going to lose your language. You're going to become a good Assyrian or a good Babylonian. And God is saying, no, <laughs> no, I am able to break in and to deliver you because of who I am. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down with us, Dr. Oswald and Nathan. Thanks.